Hi everyone, welcome back to the Minute Women podcast. My name is Grace. And I'm Linnea, and I am looking at Grace's real life face right now. We're in the same room. Uh, uh, socially distancing, of course, Yeah, but, but in the same room. So exciting to be together once again. Yeah, today was a busy day. I like scurried my butt down here after defending my master's thesis. Yeah, Grace <laughs> defended her um her master's thesis. She's a brilliant genius woman, our resident historian. Oh, thank and you. uh it was thank perfect. You. I deserve it. I deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> Naturally she was yeah. perfect. Apparently they gave her the critique that she needed minor revisions, but like yeah. who are these people to suggest that Grace isn't perfect? I don't know. I'm <laughs> Which, as I explained, I hate like, them. I literally had three revisions. One of them was like, it's just general grammar, so that's hardly like a big revision. The other two are just like citational things. So I was very happy about it. And so like that's about as good as you can do. However, the only other master's thesis defense I had ever seen, uh, my good friend Louise defended, and she was brilliant and amazing, and they were like, we have no revisions. And I was just like... I will never meet this standard <laughs> of perfection. <laughs> yeah, that's unreal. But it was great. I, I'm super, super happy to have it done. I actually, I was having stress dreams all week about it, oh. but not about the defense. It's just that I would have dreams that I was in another time zone and then needed to do math, God forbid, to figure <laughs> out what time I needed to log into Zoom. And as everyone knows, this, this is, is not, not a math, math podcast, podcast, so uh, that's difficult. Yeah, so I was <laughs> So log- that is a nightmare. <laughs> I was like logged into my Zoom meeting 20 minutes early, like before <laughs> anybody in the host, the host who was like um, oh, God. our faculty advisor, he was just like, oh, you're a... Uh, you're already here. And, and you were like, like, yes, I've been here for hours. <laughs> I was just like, but in some ways it was like, once I was in the room, it was just like, all right, the thing I was most stressed about getting right is over. And now I, I made just, it. Now I just got to present it. Though apparently my voice did quiver at one point and my good friend Natasha who was watching thought I was going to cry. Anyways, didn't cry though. That's good. Yeah. Didn't. Not crying is key. Yeah. Like step one master's thesis. Don't, don't cry. And be on time. And be on time. And you did it. That's basically it. Yeah. I feel like the defense, other than like the revisions you get, if you're in a defense, you're probably going to pass. Because right. your advisor is not going to put you in a situation where you're going to fail. Unless they're a jerk. Unless, yeah. Unless they're like Professor Umbridge from Harry Potter. <laughs> I bet yeah. she let people fail. <laughs> oh, God. <sighs> but yeah, no, my thesis advisor tweeted out my thesis defense and our podcast in the same tweet, which was super Precious. cool. Precious. And he, he had a, a Zoom background that was a chill 1970s lounge with, like, a full <laughs> portrait of Che Guevara. Um, and I was just like, I, I was I was saying, I was just like, I didn't think I'd ever have to stare down Che Guevara <laughs> in my master's thesis defense. But here we are. COVID oh. times call for COVID, like, Cuban revolutionary measures, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Um, we do want to address this week that there's been a lot going on in the media yeah. And there's been, um, we've been posting a lot and also not posting for that reason on our Instagram page. Yeah. Because of the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests that have been going on recently all over the world, basically, at this Mm -hmm. point, Um, especially, especially throughout North America and the protests against police brutality and systemic racism. And so we did just want to take a moment to draw attention to that here on the podcast today. And to let everyone know that we are here and we are listening. We have a lot to learn, but uh, the Minute Women are always here for someone to inbox us or send us a DM and let us know if we are making the right decisions and saying the right things um, through our media presence. Yeah, because, I mean, ultimately, everything we say outside of, like, just the factual research is just me and Linnea's perspectives and opinions. So. Those are purely our own, and we don't claim to know everything. So if you feel like there's something that should be addressed on the podcast or there's something that is like, hey, I think you might have gotten this wrong, please let us know Yeah, on any topic, but especially now with with everything that's going on. And actually, like, everything that was happening on social media, especially on Tuesday when there was the whole blackout, so, like, people were posting black squares, which I know people found problematic for different reasons. But whatever your opinions are on that, 
when I was going through it, it was genuinely moving to see like no one on my feed was posting anything that wasn't to do with Black Lives Matter. And that's never happened before. No matter what the uh, whether it was a former iteration of Black Lives Matter or another protest that was going on. I've never seen literally everyone posting about it. And it was funny to see the generational difference because on yeah. Facebook, everybody's yeah. mom was was like black square, like no profile picture. And then like on yeah. Instagram, it was like everybody kind of in our age bracket, that kind of millennial group. And it was really um, I found it really like inspiring to see yeah. everybody kind of come together over that. And I mean, my opinion about the entire thing, some people saw a problem with that. But for me, you know, just if like some people are posting and some people are talking and some people are sharing and some people are going to protests and some people are putting a black square as their Instagram profile picture. And for me, I just think as long as everybody's doing something and everybody's kind of moving forward and recognizing this, that I think that that, you know, just do the best that you can do Mm -hmm. um, to be open-minded and aware of the black lives matter movement and what's been going on. Yeah. I I was saying to a friend of mine yesterday that I've read more articles and felt like I'm educating myself more right now than I have since university Yeah, because I'm just trying to learn and I'm trying to be present and I'm trying to be aware and it's not it's not supposed to be a comfortable situation. No, no, especially for us. Like, yeah, you know, that's a good thing. And I mean, the protest I went to in Sydney is the first protest I've ever gone to intentionally. Like yeah. It's the first protest that I was like, all yeah. right, I'm going to put time aside in my day and I'm going to go there rather than like I stumbled upon it on my campus yeah. or whatever and like participated. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I, I wouldn't underestimate also how much COVID has invigorated this as well, because not to say that, like, obviously the racial injustice on its own deserves this kind of thing. But I think you already have a world that is on edge yeah. and has felt on edge for the last well good chunk of the year. Yep. And so now it's just like, it's like you can't, it's the star that broke the camel's back yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. All right. So yeah. what are we talking about today? What so, are we breaking down today? I mean, I don't think you're going to be surprised by the selection that I've chosen Ready. this week. This week we are doing the Viola Desmond Heritage Minute. Yes. Because she's our home girl. No, it's because our home she girl. Is. She's on the $10 bill. A little Haligonian. She is on the $10 bill now. After much deliberation, debate, and... I know. It takes Other bills. <laughs> it takes a lot to beat out the first prime minister to be on a bill. That's pretty cool. They're like, she Sir John A. Did you're she out. take him off? Sir John A. used to be on the ten, and they're like, we're gonna switch it up, and oh. so she replaced him. I'm like, yeah, going oh. from white colonist to black activist. Yeah, hell yeah. yeah. But you know, he had a rough childhood. We know that. We've been there. We've yeah, heard that story. We've heard that sob story. <laughs> Guess what? She had a hard life, too. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm going to estimate harder. <laughs> yeah, now we're going to talk about it. And now we're going to talk about it. Okay. Um, but yeah, that Bill story is actually really interesting because Cabrin University. Oh, yeah, you have a personal like, connection to this. Yeah, because so we'll get into it a little bit. But Viola Desmond, the reason that we know a lot about her is largely because her sister went on to like tell her story later on in life. And so her sister, Wanda... She's the sweetest human being in the world. She decides because sweeter CBU, than you, I don't believe. Yes. It. Oh, I'm not sweet. <laughs> we know that. I know. I have a terrible first impression with people. Uh. Wanda does not. But CBU, I think it still does, but it may not anymore. It had a program where senior citizens could go audit classes for free. I think actually you could do a whole degree for that free. is wholesome. It's very 60, wholesome. It's not a great uh, business decision, but well, very I, wholesome. I I might be getting this wrong again. Okay. I'm just a I'm just a person, but um, I'm just a person. But I believe at 65 you can take university courses for oh, free. Oh, okay, maybe that's in, what it was. In at least Nova Scotia, because my aunt did it when she turned oh, okay. 65. She went. She's a, well, she was a registered nurse, retired okay. from nursing, and then went and took philosophy and like um, hmm. theology. Just because cool. she like felt like it, I and love she was like courses. young cool. and hip. Yeah, um, but Wanda was one of those people, and she wound up in like a social justice or like history of race in Canada course with um, Professor Graham Reynolds, and Graham was one of the early people who was like, "Look at this case study of a woman by the name of Viola Desmond. This is what happened to her," and he didn't know that Wanda was her sister and like in the class and so Wanda like was like 
that's my sister. <laughs> and so they ended up collaborating on like a book and then Wanda wrote her own book called Sister to Courage, which is like, it's more of like a, a collection of stories or memoirs. Mm-hmm. Um, some are about Viola, some are about herself. But it's basically because of her that we know so much about Viola. And it, it was her and Graham and CBU that kind of champion getting Viola Desmond on a $10 bill. It's amazing. And the, the photo is from the archive that my mom ran. Like oh. that's part of her collection. Well, not her collection, but the, the so archive cool. that she managed. That's collection. also the photo that's on her. So Viola Des- Desmond and like she had a beauty line. Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah, that's yeah. the photo that's like on the on the beauty line products, yep. which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we'll get all into I'm excited. To Viola. I'm excited. And with all of the like pressing things happening in the world, we felt like it was important to do this episode right away or as soon as possible. So we actually already have an episode recorded that was going to be put out last week, but now it will be next week's episode. So if there's some incongruity in our conversations or the timeline, uh, that is why. Yes, because yeah. in that episode, Grace will be in Cape Breton. Yes. <laughs> and in this episode, Grace is here. It's all very confusing. The magic of podcasts. The future Time is here, travel. folks. The future <laughs> is here. So Viola was born to Albert and Gwendolyn Davis on July 6, 1914, which I will say when a lot of stories started being published about Viola Desmond, I would regularly mix up her name with the actress Viola Davis. Oh yeah. And so I would say Viola Davis, but that's her maiden name. Oh. Her maiden name is Davis. I was like shoot. I was right all along and I didn't even know it. You didn't. <laughs> you didn't even know it. Didn't even know it. Uh, She was one of 10 children, and her father was raised in a middle-class black family and had worked for several years as a stevedore, which is a person employed or, like, contracted to engage in, like, dock work and unload cargo ships. But eventually he established himself as a barber in Halifax. Oh, Her mother was born in Halifax, but the family wound up moving to New Haven, Connecticut shortly after the death of uh, her mother. So... Viola's mother's mother passed away when she was quite young. And Viola's mother was of mixed race, so her mother was white and her father was biracial. He was a Baptist minister. And so Viola, she's born into what would be seen as like a mixed race family, which was, it's not uncommon to see like mingling between white and black communities, but intermarriage is still pretty uncommon. So, So Viola's mom was white. Yeah, so Viola's mom was mixed race, but she was predominantly white, I suppose you could say. But I think she grew up in a very black community because her father is a Baptist minister. Right, okay. That being said, Viola's parents were accepted into Halifax black community and they became prominent and active members in various community organizations. The Davis family was very close-knit. Viola's sister Wanda described how their parents never let them know want. So they were always like... I don't I never got the impression that they were like super wealthy. I think they were fairly like middle class. Yeah. But, you know, as for 10 kids, it was kind of like you're never going to need anything. Yeah. And she also described Viola as being immaculate, chic and well quaffed. Ooh. (laughs) We have a fancy lady on our hands. She's fancy. (laughs) So the example set by her parents inspired Viola to seek out financial independence as a young woman. She was briefly a teacher in two racially segregated schools for black students, but Viola observed that Halifax's black community was in need of beauty salons. Which I just I just want to draw attention to that first, (laughs) because I just want to remind everybody that we had segregated schools in Nova Scotia and Canada. I feel like I feel like people tend to like glaze over that. Oh, yeah. And I feel like that has been a conversation through the Black Lives Matter movement because... People tend to just be like, oh, no, that only happens in the States. No, Mm-mm. no, it happened here. Oh, yeah. And and Nova Scotia's um, School for Colored Children was notoriously terrible. Yeah. Especially for like child abuse and stuff. Like it was really, really bad. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. Keeping all of that lovely context in mind. Yeah. It's, yeah. A tough, tough time. <laughs> But Viola, she doesn't want to be a teacher forever. Um, She decides that she wants to open a beauty salon. And she wanted a beauty salon that catered towards black women and provided them with specialized and professional hair and skin products. The early 20th century brought with it an expanding middle class and the advent of new hairstyles that demanded special products and maintenance. 
and an emphasis on fashion trends and personal grooming, which especially for black women to try and if you have natural hair to try and mimic the styles of white women. Yeah. You need a lot of professional care to do that <laughs> yeah. um, if you want to keep your hair healthy. Black women wanted to affirm their self-image and they wanted to establish a black beauty culture. Um, beauty parlors also provided an opportunity for female people of color to be entrepreneurs. Okay. Um, so, I mean, it's hard to be a female entrepreneur, period, but to be a black female entrepreneur yeah. is extra difficult. But these kinds of yeah. beauty salons offered that. They also often served as centers for social contact within black communities and allowed shop owners to receive a position of status and authority within communities, okay. which I think you see like again outside perspective but within like black media and stuff like the idea of like the beauty parlor being this yeah. like central location where everyone meets and like everybody knows your name well there was a great show not a white thing yeah, yeah. there was a great show on ctv though called the kink in my hair oh yeah yeah, yeah which yeah. was a great show about a about a, a barbershop a beauty salon right run and i don't remember where it was i want to say somewhere in ontario I want to say like Toronto, but I could be wrong. <laughs> but it was a group of, I think it was just women. But yeah, it was a group of black women who like ran a salon together. And oh, it was okay. about like the people who would come into their salon every yeah. day and like <laughs> the conversations that they'd have and like the regulars and the new people. And it was, yeah, it was a cool, it was a cool show. Yeah. yeah. So for Viola to achieve this dream, she first moved to Montreal to attend the Field Beauty Culture School um, because she's not allowed to train as a beautician in the white schools. Mm -hmm. And then eventually she moved to Atlantic City in New York where she studied at one of Madam C.J. Walker's beauty schools. Okay. So Madam C.J. Walker was an American entrepreneur. She's a philanthropist. Um political and social activist she's also a black woman and she made her fortune by developing and marketing a line of cosmetics and hair care for black women through the business that she founded in her own name so this is kind of like viola's like icon this is right. what she wants to start doing and through her businesses she became the first self-made female millionaire in america so That's the amazing. first self-made female millionaire was a black woman in the united states that's amazing which is super cool um and like viola for her she's like oh that's that's what i want to do that's the so she goes to one of her schools madame walker had passed away by that this point but she still had like her franchise so viola attends one of the schools she comes back to halifax and she opens her own hair salon yeah viola quickly found success initially opening vi's studio of beauty and culture Soon, Viola and her husband, Jack Desmond, opened a combined barbershop and hairdressing salon Aww. on Gottagen Street in Halifax North End. That's awesome. Yeah. Close I don't know where we are right now. Yeah. yeah, we're in Halifax North End right now, but I don't know. I, it would be interesting to if we know, like, if the building yeah. is still standing. And, on like, Gottagen. If you could, like, point it out. Yeah. Some of her clients included Portia White, who was a black Canadian concert singer, and she was kind of like the first to achieve international yeah. fame. And Gwen Jenkins, who would go on to be the first black nurse in Nova Scotia. So she was the oh. first like black student accepted into Dalhousie's nursing school. That's so I cool. Yeah. Viola's success led her to expand her business. She created a line of beauty products, like you mentioned. Yeah. Um, they're called Vise Beauty Products, yeah. uh, which she marketed and she sold herself. These products were meant specifically for black women and women of color. So, for example, her sepia face powder was marketed as especially blended to enhance dark complexions. Yeah. The compact had Viola's name and her face on the packaging. So, like, that yeah. image is the one that goes on to be on the $10 bill. So, if you've got a $10 bill in your pocket, that's the picture we're talking about. Check it out. Check it out. <laughs> She's beautiful. She is beautiful. Yeah, she was like, I was... Like going through, like there's a lot of pictures of her and stuff, and yeah. um, because Wanda has shared dainty. a lot of, yeah, she looks yeah. very small. I don't mm -hmm. actually know how tall she was, but she looks like quite a, yeah. like a petite woman. Yeah, but she's beautiful. Yeah. like she always looks like styled and on point. Yeah. <laughs> In addition to her salon, Viola opened the Desmond School of Beauty Culture, so black women would not have to travel long distances like she did to receive a formal education to become a beautician, like our. Uh, like our boy uh, Samuel Champlain. Had to travel all over. Had to travel all over. Oh, what a guy. To become an esthetician. Do you remember? You made that <laughs> oh, bit. <yeah. laughs> he gonna do your nails. He was called a what? Um, it's a ethnologist. Ethnologist. <laughs> yeah. You want your nails done? You want your nails done? <laughs> we'll just sail over here a little bit and then, and then I'll do your nails. I'll do your nails. 
The school catered towards women from Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Quebec. It didn't say PEI, though, so screw them, I guess. <laughs> screw PEI. They have no COVID. Oh, well, there jealous. was no bridge at that point. That's true. So it would have been tricky actually... for them to get over. When was the Confederation Bridge built? I think it was 97. But, I mean, there was all, there was the ferry. But even then, yeah. there might not have been a, like, a good ferry. A good ferry. Yeah. So, yeah, but it was, it was 97. Yeah. I just imagine it's always Anne of Green Gables and then like (laughs) same time this is all happening. Viola knew her school would support the growth of employment of young black women. So like that's the other thing. She's like she's very mindful of the fact that like it's not just a beauty school. 93. The bridge was built in 93. I wasn't alive. (laughs) The school operated using a vertical integration framework which I did research on to try to understand and um didn't come to you know solid conclusions but i'm pretty sure what it means is that essentially like the business owns every level of the operation so like okay students go to the school and then they could open their own vise like studio somewhere else and they could sell vise beauty products in that studio right so she's like the smart business plan absolutely which is how like madam cj walker's businesses worked right and so viola's like oh Boom, I could do that here. I can do that. I can do that. Easy. 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 (laughs) So Viola's beauty school um, every year would graduate about 15 women from the school. Which is awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, I think like her entrepreneurialship should be enough to like warrant a minute. But unfortunately, um, that is not why we know Viola Desmond today. And it's not why she has a heritage minute. But But, because of the heritage minute and mm -hmm. because of, you know, being on the $10 bill, more people are learning about the history and the successes of Viola Desmond, which I, which I think is important. I agree. I very much. Yeah. Cause I think like, we're going to tell you about it here. Tell you all about it. So now you know. (laughs) Yeah, because I mean, the it's, more it's, you know, it's one thing to talk about people and say, like, this is why they're famous and this is why you know them. But like, she was so amazing outside of all of that, yeah. too. But we more prominently know her because of her social activism against racism. Yeah. So the Canadian system of structural racism, which we absolutely do have, is not as easy to describe as the Jim Crow system in the southern United States, because while it is very real, it was unofficial. Right. So we don't have like official segregation laws. This means there, there was no legal code that specifically excluded people of color. However, racism was very much entrenched in Canadian and Nova Scotian society and produced an unwritten code that constrained the lives of black people and other people. Right. Of color. So it wasn't racism and prejudice wasn't a criminal act, but it also wasn't a, a law. It wasn't like a judicial law. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. not like you have Jim Crow where right. like we es- uh, essentially black people cannot vote. We have other instances. So like. People of like Mongolian or Chinese descent have to pay a head tax. Yeah. But it's not illegal for them to come to the country. Yeah. Like we just set up barriers. And I heard that that law was only like in the last 20, 25 years actually like removed from Canadian law. Oh, really? I, yeah. I know. I know. Like it's it was one of those. It was one time. of those like overlooked laws. Oh, I see. That yeah, yeah. just I, I there's probably a name for that, but it's like one of those. Forgotten. Yeah. Kind silly of, yeah. laws that are like actually a law, but no one. It, it's not enforced. It's like, oh, and then shit. it's like, oh, we got to take that out of there. <laughs> Guys, have we been racist this whole time? <laughs> yes. Um, but as a lot of people point out, the really like unofficial nature of Canada's racism in some ways made it harder for people affected by it to pursue changes and support. Because mm-hmm. when you have like a tangible law that says like black people can't vote, it's pretty easy to be like, that's what I'm pointing at. That's that's yeah. my problem. And when you have something written down, when you have a yeah. lot, it's easier to find loopholes and way around it than just like, oh, yeah. this is what this business decides and this is what this business decides. And there's no actually confirmed like standard law to, yeah. to break. Yeah. There's no law to break. There's just. Yeah. It's just kind of like this, this anamorphous blob yeah. of laws that like you can try to attack, but it's mm-hmm. just going to like reshape itself. And still exist. That was a great <laughs> metaphor uh, deployed by Grace. Did you know that I have a master's degree basically now? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm really smart. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like this unofficial way in which Canada enforces racism and segregation did make it more difficult to pursue charges in support. So, for example, before Viola Desmond, there was a case called the Fred Christie case in 1939. Have you ever heard of it? I had never heard of it before. I don't think so. But essentially, so in July of 1936, Fred Christie and two of his friends went to the York Tavern in Montreal to have a beer. And the staff refused to serve them because Christie was black. I didn't, I didn't see if like his friends were black, but I, I think it was like he was black and his two friends weren't. Right. So Christie sued the tavern to be like, you wouldn't take my money. Like, why? Yeah. So the case eventually reached the Supreme Court of Canada, which ruled in 1939 that the York Tavern was within its rights to refuse to serve people of color. The private business was allowed to discriminate on the basis of freedom of commerce. Oh, I so hate that. essentially, that is like bullshit. Yeah, it's like your freedom of commerce is greater than his freedom to pay for a service. I hate that. And of course, that would never happen if it wasn't a black person. <laughs> No. It's like we've decided that like so a business can choose to segregate people. Yeah. But it's not like a Canadian law. Right. It just every time I like talk about or like think about like segregation and when like segregation laws were still a thing. Yeah. Is the movie Remember the Titans. Yeah. Because like you want to cry in a movie. <laughs> yeah. Remember the Titans. <laughs> because you know Grace and I, in my eighth grade health class. <laughs> we love we love males being vulnerable. Yeah, especially if it involves football. And man. oh my gosh, are they ever all vulnerable? So race is not specifically the thing that's on trial during the Christie case, but it's so deeply interwoven into the issue that it might as well be. Right. And for certain, if Christie had been white, you know that he would have had more success in court or he never would have gone to court in the first place yeah. <laughs> he just would have been served so this case reveals an era of legalized racism that is very subtle and unspoken and like below the surface mm -hmm. but everybody knows it's there yeah it kind of reminds me of that um a few years ago there was that bakery that denied a gay couple a wedding cake oh, and it was like yeah. it was in the states but yeah. it was like does that business have the legal right to choose what customers it serves. Yeah. And I don't remember the outcome, but it's basically the same thing happening right now. So Viola's work took her around the province, and on November 8th, 1946, she was on her way to an appointment in Sydney. When she reached New Glasgow, just the worst place. The worst. Statistically, the worst place in Canada. It's constantly winning worst town to live in yeah. in Canada. So when she reaches the tiny, terrible little town of New Glasgow, uh, her car broke down. Mm -hmm. And the repair company told her it would take several hours to fix. So she just decided that she would stay in a nearby hotel for the night. And then she'd just set out fresh in the morning. Okay. But she doesn't particularly have anything to do. So she decided to go see a movie called The Dark Mirror at the Roseland Theater. Uh, Wanda remembered that the the star of that film was like one of Viola's like favorite actresses at the time. So it was just like she's going to go see her girl, Olivia, Ooh, in the film. Olivia. That was her name. Olivia de Havillard. <laughs> Ooh. 1940s film star. <laughs> So when she arrived at the theater, she went to the ticket seller and requested a down ticket. So that would be like a ticket on the main floor. So like the Roseland Theater is not legally segregated because Nova Scotia didn't have uh, segregation laws. But as in other places, Nova Scotia allowed private businesses to enforce segregation if they wished. Because, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Got to protect people's freedoms. <laughs> the freedom to be racist. Oh, my. Um, in 1941, in response to complaints from white customers, the Roseland decided to segregate its theater, forcing African Nova Scotians to sit in the balcony. They had faced complaints from the black community ever since. So ever since, the community is like, hey, we used to be able to sit wherever we want, and now we can't. Like, yeah. now it's a custom that we're not allowed to. In 1943, there was a school class that was ejected from the downstairs because their class had a black student. So like oh the God. I think like the class is white, but they have like one black student. They're like, you all can't sit here. It's like and like nothing would make a kid be like, oh, being black is wrong. Then like we got kicked out of a movie theater because yeah. of this black kid. Because of that guy. Yeah. It's like it's his fault, not Ugh. the theater's fault. Yeah. So in response to this class getting ejected, uh, Carrie Best, a black Nova Scotian journalist and a New Glasgow resident, decided to challenge the segregation. 
In protest, she arranged to purchase two down tickets to watch a film with her son, and both her and her son were arrested. Arrested? Arrested. I don't know quite how old her son is, but I was pretty sure he was, like, still a kid. Like a child. A child. Yeah. So they fought the charges. Uh, Their case was unsuccessful, Mm -hmm. but... This is partly what prompted Carrie to found the Clarion, which was one of Nova Scotia's first and most prolific black newspapers. So if you go to the Nova Scotia archives, actually, and I think on their website, they've digitized a lot of it. They have like almost a complete full run of the Clarion. Wow. Really, really interesting journal that That's talks awesome. about like black issues in Nova Scotia. And it was like run by a woman as well. That's very cool. So Viola, being from out of town, she doesn't know the political circumstances of right. this this theater. So when the ticket taker, Prima Davis, told her that she had a balcony ticket, so like she goes and she like gives them the ticket, and they're like, oh, this is a balcony ticket. She just assumed it was a mistake. So Viola went back to the ticket seller and was like, hey, I think you gave me the wrong ticket, whatever. And the cashier, Peggy Melanson, refused to exchange the ticket, despite Viola saying that she would pay the surcharge. Like, she's like, I know there's a price difference. I'm willing to pay it. Can I? I, And I I did see somewhere that, like, the reason was she was like, I'm nearsighted. Like, if I go up on the balcony, I won't even be able to see the movie. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if that was true or if that was just something they brought up as, like, a defense for her. But anyways, so... Peggy told her, I'm sorry, but I'm not allowed to sell downstairs tickets to you people, which you people. (laughs) Peggy, go jump off a cliff. (laughs) White people's favorite phrase. Oh, my God. To try and be politically correct. You people. So Peggy never said black or colored, but Viola knew that that was the reason that she wasn't able to get this ticket. And she made the spontaneous decision to walk back to the theater and sit on the main floor. So, like, this isn't, like... Go, girl, get it. Yeah, and it's, like, it's not premeditated. She's just, like, fuck it. (laughs) Yeah. I'm gonna just go sit. Because I imagine, like, part of it's, like, I was supposed to get to Sydney today. My car broke down. Yeah. She's probably already having a rough day. She just wants to watch a, like, freaking movie. She just wants to watch a movie. (sighs) So she's just, like, whatever. I'm gonna go sit on the main floor. So Prima Davis, the, the ticket, like, person, tracks her down, and she's, like, hey, you know, like, you can't sit down there, but she pretends like she doesn't hear and she just keeps walking. So Prima follows Viola into the theater and confronts her like on the floor of the theater. And Viola is now just like sitting peacefully. So now yeah. it's like the ticket people making this big show of like, hey, yeah. you're not supposed to be down here. Prima insisted that she move up to the balcony, but Viola wouldn't budge. So Prima left to report the matter to her manager, Henry McNeil. McNeil and his family were very prominent in New Glasgow, especially in the entertainment sphere. Uh, They operated the McNeil's Hall, which was like a live performance theater. And uh, fun fact, they hosted a performance of Uncle Tom's Cabin where they used blackface. Oh, no. Who could have seen this coming? That doesn't exist anymore, right? Like, they've been shunned from history, right? The theater? Yeah. I'm not sure. The Roseland Theater is still physically standing though okay. i don't it was a club for a while apparently oh, oh. new glasgow's premier nightclub <laughs> um i don't know hip what it's used as now and though. cool <laughs> hip and cool they have like i would love if like a nightclub had like a tiny little like history like <laughs> plaque where it's just like in this where the stripper pole um, is, that is where the seat was that Viola Desmond <laughs> sat on the you, main floor. You've clearly never been to the Ville in Wolfville. I have not. <laughs> because I don't think I've that. ever been to Wolfville as like a, a drinking age person. Oh, man. So Henry McNeil confronts Viola in the theater and said the theater had every right to refuse entry to people that they viewed to be of questionable character. Uh, Viola explained that she had not been denied entry. She had just been denied purchasing a specific ticket and was fully willing to pay the difference in cost to exchange it for a main floor ticket. But again, she was refused this, and so Viola resisted leaving the theater. At this point, Henry called the police. An officer entered the theater, forcefully removed her from her seat, injuring her hip and knee in the process. So they, like, just drag her out of the building, and she, like, messes up her hip in that process that's just all the while a movie is going on and everyone else is just like sitting there no doing nothing and and you know the thing is though that i don't even know if people would be shocked like at that time don't you think that some people would be like "Mm, yeah i didn't want her in here i didn't want her 
kind in here. I'm sure they were probably like miffed. They were just like, why would she ruin our night? Like, why did she have to do this thing that like ruined our night out? I hate that. It's like good for that police officer for dragging a peaceful woman out of a building. Yeah. So like the officer literally had to drag her because she was like holding onto the door jam. As yeah. they're like, like, she's like clinging for dear life to stay in the theater. Um, because obviously, like, you don't know where you're going to go. No. Like, you don't know what's going to happen to you as soon as you leave that you're theater. You're in a strange town. You're in a, yeah, exactly. You don't know anybody there. You, yeah. Wow. So once they got her out of the building, they took her immediately to jail where she was met by the police chief. And after an hour, they presented her with an, a warrant for her arrest. So that was the other thing. She was like arrested before they actually had a warrant to do so. Like they were just <laughs> detaining her forcefully against her will yeah well not many people are detained yeah by choice that's true (laughs) that's just sitting in a room (laughs) i'm choosing to be detained (laughs) um so viola spent the next 12 hours in prison she stayed all night in her cell she said that she occupied her time by taking her purse out and then like dumping its contents on the cot and then like organizing it um she worked through her like appointment book. She tried to kill time just by like keeping busy with little things like that. She did remember that at some point in the night, a group of drunk men were brought into the drunk tank. And once they realized that a woman was in there, they just started like hurling obscene comments her way, mm-hmm. um, which is like the other thing is like she's not just like a like a black person. She's like a woman alone, in jail alone in a yeah. n- new place that she doesn't know anybody. Yeah. <sighs> But Viola was determined to keep her composure, and she just remembers, like, all night she just, like, sat bolt right upright yeah. all night on the bed. So she's, like, just sitting there. The following morning, Viola was brought before a judge and was charged with attempting to defraud the provincial government based on her alleged refusal to pay a one-cent amusement tax. So she was, like, arrested for one penny. Like, the charge that they came up with. That she offered to pay. Yeah, because they can't arrest her for being a black person right. in a white place because it's not technically segregated or legally segregated. It's just right. the business's preference. So they have preference. to make up a false charge. So, yeah, so they're they're charging her with defrauding the provincial government of one penny. <sighs> she indicated when she was confronted at the theater that she had been completely willing to pay the difference, but her offer was refused. Regardless, the judge chose to fine her $26, and she could either pay this or she could spend the next 30 days in jail. (laughs) So throughout the trial, Viola was not provided any legal representation, nor was she informed that she was entitled to any. Magistrate Roderick McKay was the only legal official in the court. No Crown attorney was present. And at no point during the trial was race mentioned. However, it was clear that Desmond's real offense was to violate the implicit rule that black people were not supposed to be sitting on the main floor. They should be up in the balcony. Mm -hmm. When asked about the incident by the Toronto Daily Star, uh, McNeil, so Henry McNeil, Mm -hmm. um, maintained that there was no official stipulation that black people were not allowed to sit on the main floor. It was just customary, he said, for black people to sit in the balcony. Nonetheless, it was common knowledge among the black community in New Glasgow that seating at the Rosalind Theater was racially segregated. Yeah. So, again, like, she's not from that community, so she doesn't know that. She doesn't know the made-up rule that nobody really knows that's in place. Exactly. (laughs) The unwritten rules, shockingly, she doesn't know about. (laughs) So Viola was too emotionally and physically shaken up to finish her business trip. Duh. Yeah. So she goes home. Her father was intensely upset when he saw the state of his daughter. He was extremely protective of Viola and was livid to hear that she had been manhandled by the police. He insisted that he go see the family doctor, Dr. Waddell, who was a uh, West Indies doctor. So he's he like, insisted that she go see the doctor? Yeah, yeah so okay. he's like, no, Viola, you're not okay. Just go to the doctor. Yeah. Um, like a good dad would. Yeah. So this doctor, he is a black doctor, and so he can't... Again, like, I don't think there's an official rule that says black people can't be doctors in the province, but, like, when he moved there from the West Indies, he was, like, denied a license. So he, like, essentially can't practice. But he had, like, like, he essentially practiced but could only see black patients. Right. So he was appalled by what happened to Viola, and he suggested that she sue. Viola's sister, Wanda, later learned that Dr. Waddell had actually written a series of letters to the federal government about his disgust over the incidents, but nothing ever came of his letters. So while nothing came of the letters, they do symbolize what, like, many black Nova Scotians felt about Viola's case. Mm -hmm. So they were, like, 
for them it was just like again like this like sense of frustration that this had taken place. Um, and she began to receive letters of support throughout the black community. So uh-huh. like people are like, you should sue, you should resist, you should appeal these charges. Mm-hmm. Viola was uncertain of how to handle the situation. So she sought advice from Perlene Oliver and her husband, Reverend William Oliver. The couple were a like founding members of the Nova Scotian Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Um, which fun fact, my mom did like an interview with Perlene as part of her like graduate studies. That's so cool. And they, that interview was like published in one of the books I was going through. So then I was like flipping through, there's like Catherine Arson. And I was like, that's my mom's name. That's my mom. (laughs) That's my mom. (laughs) Um, so she like interviewed her kind of like about this situation. The association took up, uh, Viola's cause and they encouraged her to fight. Uh, Viola was also put in contact with Carrie Best. So that was the woman who had protested at Roseland Theater and now oh. runs the Clarion. And so she's obviously like, oh, Passionate this like about this. Yeah, yeah, it's like that's my hometown. And so she's like, the Clarion will be on your side. We'll like publish articles about it. Nice. So ultimately, Viola decided to appeal her case to the Nova Scotian Supreme Court. The association and the church paid for her lawyer, Frederick visit and the clarion reported on the whole trial women supporting women women supporting love it so not everyone in viola's life was so outspokenly in support of her Mm -hmm. um so wanda remembers that she's like working for the federal government at this time she's the only black person at her job and she remembered a co-worker being like hey isn't that your sister and she was just like yes and then like wouldn't talk about it anymore because she's just like i didn't like I don't want to be the black person at work. Yeah. And I don't want to have to talk about this. She later said, like, I'm, like, disappointed in myself that, like, I missed the bigger point and I missed out on supporting my sister. But she was like, I was living this life where I was trying not to be black. Right. Without realizing, like, that's impossible for me to do. Yeah. Viola's husband, Jack, was also not super in support of her trying to fight, which they actually show in the Heritage Minute. Yeah. So he's like, do you know what this is going to do to us? Like, yeah. um, so Jack had grown up in New Glasgow and he was like basically surprised. He's like, didn't you know? <laughs> like, he's like, don't you know better than to yeah. like go make a big scene like that? Um, and for him, he's like, you know, we have like this really great business going. Mm. Are you sure you want to like rock the boat? Yeah. Um, so his advice was to take it to the Lord with a prayer. <laughs> Essentially just like keep that between you and God. <laughs> We're not going to challenge any of these things. Yeah. So during the subsequent trials, the government insisted on arguing that this was a case of tax evasion. It was not a case of segregation. Oh, my Um, God. The provincial act regulating cinemas and movie theaters required the payment of an amusement tax based on the price of the theater ticket. So in this case, because she she paid for a cheaper seat but then took the more expensive seat, seat, she was defrauding the government of one cent. And Viola's lawyer decided that they he thought they'd have a better chance of success if they just kind of ran with the tax evasion thing rather than refocusing it and saying hey this isn't like yeah and i think it's probably because you know like because they hadn't prosecuted her racially right he probably felt like he couldn't bring that up yeah but because of that the whole case got dismissed on a technicality so the worst part is that like the justice who was overseeing it was like you know if this had been brought forward as like a racial issue i probably could have ruled on it differently like he he was like and i do think he was genuine he was like do you believe that i do because so in his closing statements he says um one wonders if the manager of the theater who laid the complaint was so zealous because of a bona fide belief that there had been an attempt to defraud the province of nova scotia of a sum of one cent or was it a endeavor to enforce a jim crow rule by misuse Mm. of a public statute Mm. so he's like it sounds like you're abusing the law to segregate people Mm -hmm. but but you're saying that the case was dismissed though so she didn't get charged with anything Uh, no so the case gets her appeal gets thrown out of court because of a um uh, a technicality oh yeah so viola's lawyer was so disappointed that he never charged for his services (laughs) i was like oh you gotta feel bad there are good people there 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 are some good people in the world just a few (laughs) just a couple in history dusting (laughs) (laughs) 
They're the confection sugar <laughs> on the world. <laughs> So in the aftermath of the trial, Viola's marriage began to fall apart. Um, Jack didn't like that, that she was she, a strong-willed woman, kind of. And and Wanda remembers like you know like all, like she remembered that this whole trial thing didn't really like fit his persona of that like he's the king of Gottage and Street. Like he, it sounds like he was like an alpha like yeah man and like just couldn't handle all of this like stuff <sighs> happening. Apparently, he never liked that Viola, like, traveled so much for work anyways. Like, she's already, like, a really independent, like, yeah. person. And I so I think that this was, like, the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. So the two wound up separating. Viola started looking for something else to do. She, <laughs> You're going to say for a new man. I was like, girl, get it. <laughs> get it. <laughs> she started looking around. Um, no, she started investing in real estate, um, and she would rent to black families. Uh, she kept her beauty business for a few years, but eventually she decided to close Vi's studio of beauty culture and did not continue to supply customers with the beauty products Aww. that she had created um, and gave up on plans to eventually franchise. Yeah. So the Nova Scotia Association for the Advancement of Color People had wanted her to, like, go on a speaking tour, essentially. Like, wow. be an advocate. And Wanda remembered, like, partly, like, Boyle, she wasn't, like, a public speaker. She, like, she didn't like speaking yeah. in front of a lot of people but she viola spoke with her father and her father was just like well what do you want and she said i'm halfway where i want to be i've got a class of 15 girls who have six more months of training before they graduate and when they graduate i want another class and so her father was just like so your answer is no yeah like viola just had other goals yeah. and so and I, I think that's very admirable. I think it's easy to like cave to the pressure of like, yeah, there's a whole group of marginalized people and you've got to like carry them on your shoulders yeah. suddenly, especially because like her thing at the theater was like, I didn't even go in there planning to do it. Yeah. Like, I just did it. This wasn't a, this wasn't a protest. Like she didn't go in there. It, yeah. And I mean, I, I believe now, correct me if I'm wrong, that the, that Viola Desmond, this happened after Rosa Parks. Uh, no, I think she's this before. This was pre-Rosa Parks. Yeah. Because so I think Rosa Parks is in the 50s. Cause this that's, is 46. Right. Because that's the same. Like, Rosa Parks didn't get on the bus that day. With the intention with the of intention doing anything. With the intention to, like, you know, become Rosa Parks. She just got on a bus and just wanted to take a damn seat. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So for the rest of her life, Viola would encourage women in her family to pursue real and legal charges when faced with injustice. So, yeah. like, Wanda remembered, like... If ever there were situations like I think she recalled a situation where her mom's she had in, her mom had invested in something and then her lawyer had essentially like like stolen money from her. Mm -hmm. And Viola was like, get your money back. Yeah. Like She's like, de like stand something. up for yourself. Yeah. yeah. Viola herself left Nova Scotia for Montreal to take a business course before she moved to New York, where she tried her hand at becoming a talent agent for entertainers. So now she's going to try and, like, represent people. It's cool. She came back to Nova Scotia to visit her parents and family fairly regularly. When her mother passed away in 1963, Viola was intent on, like, selling her apartment in New York. And so she's going to, like, move home and take care of her father, who right. himself was quite sick. And the only siblings that were still around were Wanda and their brother Jackie. And they both had, like, full-time jobs. And Wanda also had, like, three kids. Mm -hmm. So Viola's, like all right, like, I'm going to take this upon myself and yeah. I'm going to move home and take care of their dad. Yeah. Viola would, like, stay and cared for their father with, while the doctor was making house calls. And when the doctor came to the house, he was like, hey, Viola, you're, like, you're looking pretty, like, pale. You, like, you should probably, like, go see a doctor yourself. Okay. Um, but she was just like, no, I'm fine. I'm just, like, tired. I'm, like, taking care of my dad all the time. Yeah. Um, so their father passed away in September of 1964, um, and then Viola decided to return to New York. So she's like, OK, I guess I'll just like go back to my old life. But she told Wanda at their dad's funeral, like, I'll be back. I'm just going to like clean up my business affairs and like the few things that I have left there, tie up loose ends. And then I'm going to move back permanently to Nova Scotia. OK. But she never did because oh. Viola died of internal bleeding a few months later what? on February 7th, 1965. She was only 50. Oh, my God. And that's the other thing, like. And, and that's like Wanda was like we had no idea how sick she was in what year did she pass away 1965 wow um and yeah so they were like we 
had no idea that she was like we knew she was like not feeling great but like we didn't know it was on that level awful yeah absolutely and she like it's devastating i know and wanda reflected in her book i don't think the world knew how important a person had just been lost yeah i think her story was pretty much forgotten the roseland theater was not mentioned in any of her obituaries 20 years had passed since the, the incident so it's really not until decades after her death that viola desmond's story kind of starts to receive the public attention, largely due to the efforts of Wanda and uh, Graham Reynolds at Cape Breton University. So since then, Viola has been formally pardoned by the Nova Scotian government, and the government has apologized for carrying out their acts of injustice Mm -hmm. uh, against the black community. And now the Canadian Mint has her featured on the $10 bill. They sure do. They sure do. And that's the story of Viola Desmond. Wow. Yeah. I'm sad... I'm sad I didn't know all of that. It's she's oh, pretty cool. And it's also a good time to note that Neptune Theater. Oh yeah. Are uh, they still doing it? <laughs> COVID nineteen, you know? <sighs> yeah. Um I'm I actually not know sure. the girl who plays Viola. Oh really? Yeah. I'm not sure what on with what went on with it. Yeah, and the name of that play is Controlled Damage and it's being put on by Neptune. Like I said, COVID nineteen, I'm not sure where it's at right now, but it's yeah. it's pretty cool because it was uh, written um, for Neptune Theater, so it's like world premiere. Um, yeah, when it premiered, or if it's going to premiere, like I said, nobody knows anything <laughs> right now. But uh, but it is in Halifax, which is super cool. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And so it's a, it's about our story, giving more, putting putting a lens on Viola Desmond even more, which I think is so important because yeah, and I th- and the thing that I I like a lot about her is that sure like. The, the one act at the Rosen Theater, I think, is kind of how the outside world defines her. Right. But I don't think that's the way that she no, would she, she would have looked at herself. Yeah. She's like, that was the thing I did. And I tried my best to, like, make yeah. the best out of it. Yeah. It didn't but, define her. Yeah. She's yeah. like, I'm an entrepreneur. I have my own business. I'm yeah. a teacher of young black women. Like, I, I think I'm busy. Her, yeah, she, she she's busy. busy. <laughs> she's busy, but also her like contributions to like the black community, yeah. I think, can't be measured by that one day. Yeah. Like, she yeah. before that and after that was like yeah. an advocate for black women, especially. And obviously, someone who her younger sister was obviously very proud of, you know, yeah, for yeah, her contributions. And that says a lot about a person. Yeah. I highly recommend people read Wanda's book. It's called Sister to Courage. And it's yeah. like, because it's really, it's coming from the perspective of someone who's like, I wasn't the activist. I wasn't the person who was standing up for everything. No. I, I had that role model in my life and it took me a lot longer to appreciate right. what all those things meant. But it's just the experience of like, yeah, she's like, my whole life I tried to fight being black and I came yeah. to realize that like society's never going to let you do that. So the yeah. only thing you can control is how society perceives blackness. Yeah. She's also just like the sweetest woman in the world. Yeah. Like I've met her on like a couple of occasions and she always like remembers my name. I'm like, you must meet so many people. I talk to so many like different people all the yeah. time. But, like you remember my name for some well, reason. You know, <laughs> let's let's dedicate this episode to Wanda. Yeah, this episode shout out to Wanda Robson. She's yeah. the best. She's dedicated so to her. so lovely. Amazing lady. Yeah. If she listens to this Hi. <laughs> Hope we get to chat again at some point in the future. <laughs> again, yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. We really appreciate it. Uh, we also love hearing from you. So if you want to shoot us a direct message or a tweet at us, uh, if you have questions about our episodes or if you just want to ask us some random questions, we appreciate it either way. Uh, yeah, it makes can, us feel special. It makes us feel good. So you can <laughs> find us on Instagram at Minute Women Podcast and on Facebook at the same handle. And then you can find us on Twitter at The Minute Women. And if you want to rate, review, subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you listen to. Because we're everywhere. We're <laughs> everywhere. We are prolific at this point. Um, but it's a really big help to us, especially if you want to give us some like five star reviews. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's shout super out, awesome for Shout us. out to my pal, Alex Boyd, who gave us the <laughs> sweetest review. She's amazing. Thank you, shout Alex. Shout out to Alex. <laughs> and you can also find all of our social media handles, all of the episodes, and the sources to all of the episodes on our website at www.minutewomenpodcast.ca. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.
Thank you.